before we start uh, this is a very warm welcome to all the audience and professor david fidor who's really kind and generous to join us at the you know it, it's a late night at his end but we are very thankful that he has agreed uh, for this talk so uh, as usual i mean i will i will introduce him so professor david fidor is the uh, cs hamish young professor of microbiology and immunology of uh, Medical Sciences in Medicine at Columbia University Medical Center. He is also the founding director of Columbia University Center of Malaria Therapeutics and Antimicrobial Resistance, and he is the director of NIH-funded Columbia University Graduate Program Training Program in Microbiology and Immunology. Uh, Professor Fidoc uh, received his uh, uh, graduate in mathematics with honors from Adelaide University in 1886, and PhD in microbiology from the Pasteur Institute, Paris in 1994. Uh, his postdoctoral research at UC Irving uh, with Anthony James and NIH with Thomas Wellms. Uh, he started his group at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York in 2000 and moved to Columbia University in 2007. His research program focuses mainly uh, on the genetic and molecular basis of anti-malarial drug resistance in Plasmodium falciparum and on drug discovery and development. He has authored around 250 articles on malaria and is very well known in, in, in the uh, field of uh, <coughs> anti-malaria drug resistance. His work is supported by NIH, uh, Bill Melinda Gates Foundation in Medicine with a Malaria Venture. He has received several awards and honors. In 2014, he has received ASTMH LAK Ashford Medal. In uh, 2016, he was named Advanced Global Australian of the Year in Life Sciences and a Fellow of ASS, AST MH. In 2020, he received AST MH Prager Award and MMB Project for of the Year Award. In 2022, recently, he became a member of WHO Malaria Policy Advisor. And uh, this this is a very short introduction. He uh, and uh, today today he will talk on you know how to manage global spread of drug resistant malaria by using genetic and pharmacological means. So with this, uh, with this, I again welcome uh, Professor David Fidoc with his very colorful and, uh, you know, interesting shirts of his lab members. <laughs> this is all yours, Professor Fidoc, please. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sharma. Uh, thank you, Sachin, for, for inviting me. It's really an honor to uh, to give this talk and you know it's the, india has the most remarkable history of malaria research which is which is also very active so it's it's really a pleasure and and i'm glad i'm still wide awake so it's all good um so my laser point has sort of disappeared uh, so i won't be able to point little things out but you can see here this is our our team it's a fairly large team uh we're about um, 18 people at present. It's mostly international. Um, I keep the Americans down to a fairly small quota, <laughs> no more than 30%. So um, there's actually, uh, we have three Indians in the lab at present, uh, one born in Kenya, Sunil Nawal, Satish Dingra, um, and uh, Vandana Tati. There's uh, individuals from Australia, from Belgium, from Singapore, from Malaysia, from Japan, Brazil, Germany, um, Kenya, South Africa, uh, and New Zealand. So it's a, it's a real little United Nations that we have here going on. Um, New York is a very international, very cosmopolitan city, nowhere near as big as, some, as Delhi, for example, but um, still pretty big. <laughs> and um, we are in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology, and I have a joint appointment in the Division of Infectious Diseases at, um, in the Department of Medicine. So, uh, and today I'll be talking to you then about um, the research that we do in my lab to really focus on the issue of drug resistance and how we can leverage that information or that knowledge gained to try to sort of improve treatment outcome and help guide um, uh, choices of, of, uh, of suitable therapeutics and also um, contribute to uh, research into discovering and developing new antimalarial medicines. So let me, okay. So I think all of you know the malaria parasite life cycle. So this is a cycle then shared between the mosquito host. Oh, here we are. Here's my little laser pointer. This is good. Between the mosquito host here and the human host, just to point out, I, my lab is, is really a molecular genetics lab. 
And so we do a lot of uh, research on genetically modifying malaria parasites. And so it's important to note that the stage of sexual recombination and meiosis occurs in the mosquito midgut with, their, with recombination occurring here during the sexual stage development. The sporozoites are the recombinant progeny or the progeny of, of the initial infection from the, from the gametes that fuse, initiating the liver stage infection. Of course, in India, you have the plasmonium vivax, which is capable of uh, generating hypnozoites. In the case of falciparum, they will go straight through the liver, um, replicating prodigiously, producing upwards of 10,000 parasites per infected hepatocyte to initiate the blood stage infection. So I've actually researched the entire life cycle over the last sort of 32 years of my research in malaria. But the focus of my lab is mostly on the blood stages. They're easy to propagate. And of course, that's the source of, of drug resistance. We've also done some work on identifying inhibitors of, of gametocytogenesis and transmission. Uh, and these are all haploids. So where are we in the fight against malaria? Well, I think this audience is, it really knows this topic very well. I'll be focusing on the issue of drugs as really a cornerstone of malaria treatment. Uh, the constant need for new drugs that are not uh, compromised by existing mechanisms of resistance. Uh, of course, a really important component of current malaria control efforts is also the use of insecticides. These probably have an even greater role in reducing the burden of disease um, that we've accomplished since 2000. Although, of course, as we know, the situation has gotten worse recently, and especially in the last year uh, with upwards of 600,000 um, deaths attributed to malaria. So for insecticides, there are two major strategies, the use of indoor residual spraying and the use of these long-lasting insecticide-treated bed nets. Uh, of course, an issue there is the acquisition of resistance by the Anopheles mosquito vector, either to the pyrethroids um, through detoxification mechanisms or behavioral where mosquitoes simply learn to evade um, areas where they have to touch insecticide-treated surfaces such as walls. Bed nets are very important. They're a very important component of the malaria control program worldwide. Vaccines, as we know, it's been impossible to develop vaccines against blood stages until now. Part of that, of course, is the very prolific nature of the blood stage infection, the very large numbers, upwards of 10 to the 12 uh, organisms per host. There has been progress, as, as we know, in New England, the WHO last October um, formally approved the first malaria vaccine based on the use of the sporozoite surface protein that coats the surface of the sporozoite that uh, is paired with a very powerful adjuvant um, that elicits a, a reasonably protective antibody response and a T cell response against the infected hepatocyte and, in, and against the sporozoites. This is not the panacea, it's not sufficient, but there are data showing that if you can combine that vaccine called RTSS with um, seasonal malaria chemo prevention um, approaches or, or uh, programs, you can substantially reduce mortality and reduce the overall burden of disease in that area. So there is some hope that RTSS and there's a need for RTSS to be an additional um, component of a sort of coordinated malaria control and treatment program. So my lab has focused for many years now on anti-malarial drug resistance. And so shown here is a timeline um, dating back to the 1600s when quinine was first uh, imported into Europe. Um, it had been found uh, in South America. It's, uh, it's from... Um, uh, a chinchona tree. It was called Jesuit's bark. It was basically uh, created as you could drink um, extract of this bark to, to treat fever. Uh, and you can see as we go forward in time, we've got chloroquine entering first line clinical use in the late 1940s. Um, these inverted black triangles indicate the year when clinical resistance was first reported. So you can see quinine here, a documented um, instances of treatment failure in, in 1910. Chloroquine coming in as the first line um, and many years until resistance, in, in this case about 12 years before there was a report of clinical resistance, and I will focus more on that during the talk. 
Um, but chloroquine continued to be a very important drug until it was really replaced by the artemisinin-based combination therapies. And as we know, for example, in India, chloroquine is still widely effective against Plasmodium vivax. Uh, then there was the adoption of proguano. Uh, this really didn't work very well. That was later replaced by uh, a similar combination called sulfadoxine pyrimethamine, or SP. This is still in use in parts of India as first line combined with artesanate. Uh, unfortunately, the SP component clinical resistance was observed within the first year. And so you can see a period here in the sort of 70s and 80s when actually resistance was quite widespread to both of these drugs. These were the two first line antimalarials. And this is when we really started to see a spike, particularly in Western Africa, with upwards of a million deaths per year because resistance was so widespread to chloroquine and it had become such an essential household medicine. So the situation began to improve when um, artemisinin, Chinese sweet wormwood um, product or extract, uh, its chemical structure was solved. And this uh, was shown to have very effective antimalarial properties, um, but it's a very short-lived drug. And so it was impossible to use alone and it was important to combine it with a partner drug. And there were a number of combinations, preparoquin is one, or the drug known as AL, which is um, an artemisinin derivative known as artemitha, paired with lumefantrine. Uh, there's also a ASSP, this is also used in India. Again, the issue being that of resistance to sulfadoxin pyrimethamine, potentially compromising efficacy, but efficacy uh, coming, a, a large part of it coming from the potency of the artemisinin compound. Uh, in this case, it's artesanate. And so all these, you can see decorated here across the slide, all these inverted triangles indicating the, the acquisition of resistance in Plasmodium falciparum, and I'll be talking about falciparum essentially exclusively today, um, compromising all of these drugs with the exception of AL. Uh, even in Africa, where there's the, obviously the greatest burden of disease, uh, AL continues to be effective. There are some reports of reduced clinical efficacy, but those have not been validated. There's no validated parasitological resistance to the lumefantrine component. And so for now, AL is holding up. The concern will be if artesanate fails or the artemisinin fails, will that lead to um, the gain of resistance to lumefantrine, as we've seen with other combinations worldwide? And I'll be talking about that more later. So before we dig too deep into the into the genetics, I just wanted to introduce uh, this schematic of the uh, of an intraerythrocytic asexual blood stage parasite, and and how these drugs are thought to work. So here's a, a parasite a resident within a vacuole in the infected erythrocyte. So this is a, a two membrane system separating the parasite from the red cell inside the parasite as it develops. It, it, it develops this large acidic digestive vacuole, which is sort of lysosomal-like in nature. It's importing hemoglobin from the red cell cytosol into this compartment, the digestive vacuole. This is a very high concentration. It's about five millimolar. Uh, hemoglobin is a tetramer of four hemes, uh, which coordinates, obviously, the, the passage and release of oxygen around the body. Um, the parasite degrades hemoglobin through a series of enzymatic reactions involving uh, different enzymes uh, that we term plasmepsins and falsipanes. These are different types of hemoglobin, hemoglobin proteases or hemoglobinases. These uh, cleave apart the hemoglobin and the globin then is then further processed down into amino acids to then be used to synthesize protein, parasite proteins uh, for its development. As it breaks down hemoglobin, it also releases toxic heme in an Fe2 plus state, which is the state used to conjugate to oxygen. Um, this will rapidly oxidize in this highly acidic compartment. And this is a highly reactive species that can, uh, that can attack membranes and cause membrane damage, um, ionic sort of um, dysregulation and, and cellular death. And the way many of these drugs work, uh, like chloroquine, but also some of the partner drugs, amodiaquine, preparoquine, to point these out, is that they are thought to bind heme and form a complex that prevents the heme from being incorporated into this, into this chemically inert crystal known as hemozoan. So what's important to note here is that the target of these drugs, therefore aminoquinoline, is heme, which is of human origin, which itself cannot mutate. 
So the only way parasites can acquire resistance to these drugs that act on a, on a target of, of human origin is to acquire mechanisms to efflux them away from their target. And that's what they've done in this case with PFCRT, which I'll talk about today, which is the major sort of um, carrier or transporter for the efflux of drugs out of the digestive vacuole away from heme, preventing, uh, theref- thereby enabling heme to continue its detoxification via its incorporation into hemozoin. Many of the antimineral drugs intersect with this pathway of hemoglobin endocytosis and metabolism and heme detoxification. Uh, we know that lumofantrin and mefloquine probably act upstream of, of uh, heme detoxification. They may be in part inhibiting the process of uh, the actual import or endocytosis of hemoglobin. Artemisinin is also involved in this pathway because artemisinin is essentially a prodrug that's activated by the iron 2 form of heme, the ferry protoporphyrin 9, um, and that then activates um, artemisinin to become this carbon-centered radical that then is very non-specific in its mechanism of parasite killing. So I want to focus first on artemisinins because these really are the core of all first-line um, combination therapies. They're known as artemisinin-based combination therapies, or ACTs. This is the plant from which the artemisinins are derived, and then they're further chemically sort of derivatized to form the, the derivatives used in the current medicines, such as artemisinin, um, artemitha artesanate, or dihydroartemisinin, which is also known as DHA. So these are very potent derivatives. Uh, they can reduce the parasite biomass by up to 10 to the 10,000 every 48 hours. So if you have an infection that begins with, let's say, 10 to the 12 or 10 to the 11, you know, very quickly you're, you're knocking the parasite burden down to uh, subclinical levels. Uh, the problem, of course, is that they're, they're, they're activated by the iron that's in abundance in the infected erythrocyte. Uh, and they're very rapidly cleared. So the plasma half-life is about one hour for many of these derivatives. And so they're actually really only fully effective clinically or parasitologically <coughs> for a few hours but before their levels, um, before they're, they're uh, excreted basically and, um, and uh, no longer effective against the parasite. And so that's why we need to, to use a partner drug to clear the residual infections. It's also important to note that these are active against the early um, gametocytes, the stages that will then go on to infect the mosquito. So this is a historical slide showing uh, the evidence that was reported back in 2009 in New England Journal of Medicine by Arjen Dondorp, uh, working with colleagues from Oxford in, in Cambodia and Thailand and the Greater Mekong subregion. And what they showed here on the y-axis is the parasite density. These are uh, patients admitted to hospital, treated with monotherapy, of artesanate just showing here, or combination therapy, artesanate mefloquine, and comparing individuals from Thailand <coughs> with individuals from Cambodia. And what you basically see is that the Cambodian individuals, there was much slower clearance going down to sort of subdetectable levels compared to the patients from Thailand. And so this was the first evidence of this, what we call delayed parasite clearance phenotype that was indicative of um, a gain of partial resistance to the artemisinin component. Uh, and then we could see this started to spread quite quickly um, across the region and really started to saturate the greater Mekong subregion here, um, concentrated uh, at least initially in Western Cambodia. There was substantial work conducted by a number of groups to identify the genetic basis of this phenotype. Um, it ended up being solved by a group from France uh, and the Pasteur Institute in Cambodia that used whole genome sequence analysis uh, to look for genes that were mutated uh, with an increased sort of rate of mutation in these patients, uh, in parasites from patients with these delayed clearance phenotypes. And they identified a gene previously unknown called K13 that harbored uh, one of a number of different mutations. The most common was one called C580Y. Uh, that was highly statistically significantly associated with this delayed parasite clearance phenotype. So they reached out to us. This was back in 2014. This was Didier Menard and his colleagues, and they provided us with parasites from Cambodia that uh, had um, mutations in this gene. Uh, 
This was an assay that was developed by the DMNR and a colleague of his, Benoit Bitkovsky, to basically create an in vitro surrogate for the clinical phenotype of delayed parasite clearance. And this, because artemisinins act across all stages of um, development of the intraerythritic parasite, but the resistance mechanism itself is only um, evident in the early rings. Of course, the rings are the ones that are circulating, the more mature parasites are the ones that are sequestered in the microvasculature uh, bound and, and no longer circulating, hiding essentially from the spleen. And so they had developed an assay called the ring stage survival assay, whereby you uh, prepare very tightly synchronized parasites. And just after they've invaded erythrocytes, you collect them and you pulse them with a fairly high concentration of an artemisinin. In this case, we use dihydroartemisinin or DHA. You expose them for six hours, you wash out the drug, and then you measure the survival three days later. So you measure the survival of the mock treated and then the survival of the DHA treated. And you express the DHA treated as a percentage survival of the mock, of the control. And so what we see here, for example, here are two parasites from Cambodia, each harboring a mutation in K13. In this case, it's called R539T. This is a log 10 scale, and you can see about 40% or more of those parasites survived that pulse. And when we just pulled that mutation out, we got a over a hundred fold reduction these are fully sensitive. Essentially, we're down to background levels of survival. You can do the converse. These are parasites that we obtained also from Cambodia, different strains, where you can introduce these mutations and you can see a significant gain of survival. So this basically showed that in vitro, we could phenocopy this situation of increased survival manifesting as delayed parasite clearance um, simply through uh, point mutations in this one gene called K13, also known as Kelch 13. So we've uh, fast forward now to a much more recent situation. This was work by DDMNR with support from the WHO, where they had uh, an extensive look worldwide at the prevalence of K13 mutations. Uh, and then they mapped it onto this phylogenetic tree or this sort of clade. And you can see the parasites actually sort of segregate by region. Uh, so here's Rwanda, here's the rest of Africa, these are parasites in Southeast Asia, these are parasites in South America, so you can geographically segregate these based on, on their genomes. Uh, these were all sequenced, and these are the sites uh, looked at, examined in um, Sub-Saharan Africa. And you can see almost all of these regions are wild type for K13, so no evidence of the in vitro molecular marker of resistance, except for this little country here, Rwanda, where we saw this one mutation starting to pop up called R561H um, as a, at a low prevalence of all the mutations. So this was the first evidence that maybe K13, which was very dominant in Southeast Asia at the time, was starting to appear in Sub-Saharan Africa. In a paper that we just published um, a few months ago in eLife, we asked the question, Will African strain, are African strains able to manifest artemisinin resistance just based on the introduction of these one of this single point mutation in this K13 gene? Um, and what's the impact on fitness? And the reason we focused on fitness, which in this case means the sort of relative rate of growth of these parasites in vitro, is that parasite, if this mutation introduces a substantial fitness cost, that would slow the parasites down relative to a wild type um, competing parasite. And you can imagine in a context in Africa of high transmission, high immunity, relatively low therapeutic pressure because many patients are being infected without actually being treated, that would suffice, at least in theory, to create a disadvantage that would preclude or at least slow down the spread of a mutation that drives resistance. And so we looked at those two parameters. And so here what you're seeing are four different African strains. The strain, which is the reference strain in many malaria labs called 3D7, which we actually mapped to, um, which mapped very closely to strains of, of, that originated from Rwanda. <laughs> so sort of East Africa, East Central. F32 from Tanzania and these two strains from Uganda, UG659 and A15. 
And so we've used a technique of CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing to introduce these individual point mutations into these genetic, different genetic backgrounds. And then we use the ring stage survival assay to measure the percent survival of K13 wild types or these various mutants on these different genetic backgrounds. So if we look, for example, at the, at the reference 3D7, uh, about 1% survival on the wild type, and this is a binding site control, so a recombinant <clears throat> control not expressing any of the amino acid mutations. Now, here's the mutation that had been observed in Rwanda, and you can see a fairly decent gain of resistance. It's about 8%. It's not as high as we see in Southeast Asia, where you can see 24% and sometimes even up to 40%. Um, but the mutation was enough to sort of confer a moderate degree of this sort of um, partial resistance phenotype that we see with K13. C580Y is the dominant mutation in Southeast Asia, and it was fairly similar to the 561. This is one that was reported in a Chinese worker who'd come back from Equatorial Guinea that also gave about the same level of resistance. If we look in Uganda, these strains, again, moderate levels of resistance when you introduce uh, K13 mutations. If you look at this strain from Tanzania, F32, none of these mutations had, a, has a, had an impact on resistance. They all stayed in the sensitive range. <coughs> and what that tells us, or what that suggests to us, is that there must be an important genetic component that dictates to what degree these mutations confer resistance. And I think that's uh, also important in the context of Southeast Asia, where you get much higher levels of resistance, there must be other aspects of those genomes that have essentially co-evolved with K13 that allow the K13 mutations to mediate high-grade resistance. If we now look at fitness, what we've done in these experiments is we're basically pairing these parasites together um, to the reference wild type and then we're using a variety of different techniques. Uh, some of them are TACMAN-based PCR techniques. Um, and we track the prevalence of the mutation over time in mixed culture competition with the wild type. So for example, here with 3D7, this is the 580Y or the neighboring mutation 579I, you can see quite clearly a loss um, that it's relatively unfit and the wild type is taking over fairly quickly. This is within 20 generations of in vitro growth. F32 is the same, the lions from Uganda, this one, there was not much loss of fitness. Um, 815, again, fitness was quite substantial. And so you can then um, quantify this and figure out what's the fitness cost per generation. And it's quite substantial. So for example, these lines from Uganda, um, you could see there was a moderate degree of resistance and yet it's afforded about a 12% uh, reduced rate of growth per generation. That's a very significant fitness cost. If we look at PFCRT, which is the driver of clock and resistance, um, the fitness cost there would be more in the realm of sort of 2 to 3%. Southeast Asia, again, it's sort of often less than 5%. So this is much less fit than we would see in Asian contexts where those parasites have evolved to be uh, more resistant and less unfit, if you will. And so quite a, again, quite a different range of fitness costs depending on the genetic background. And then what you can do is you can map in vitro resistance and compare it to the fitness cost. And what you'll see here is that the parasites that are the most resistant, in this case, the ones from Uganda, had the greatest fitness cost. Uh, the one that had the least fitness cost was also the least resistant. And at least for these backgrounds, that would suggest that we have yet to see a parasite where you get high-grade resistance with a minimal fitness cost, that would be the most dangerous parasite you could imagine. And so um, in data that I haven't shown here, but we've just had accepted as a letter in New England Journal of Medicine, we've extended this to look at mutations that came from, that have arisen uh, also in Uganda. And we now know there was a New England Journal of Medicine paper last year providing some evidence of a clinical phenotype of uh, mutant K13 in, uh, in Uganda and Rwanda as well. We're seeing that. We've put those into uh, different genetic backgrounds. And again, we're seeing only a very small impact on resistance of these new mutations popping up in Uganda. So we don't think this is yet at a crisis point, but there's a lot of focus on what's happening in, in Africa, because if we start to lose the artemisinin,
<clears throat> we'll have a gain of uh, much more selective pressure on the partner drug. And of course, what we cannot afford is for AL to, to be lost in Africa. <coughs> Sorry. So I'm going to delve a little bit more into mechanism now and look at K13 and what it actually does to the power side. Um, a little bit aside from the, <coughs> from the genetics. This was work done by Sartre Mock from Singapore, a really brilliant systems biologist who's now system professor in my group. Um, and what she did here is use transcriptomics to look at the intraerythrocytic developmental cycle as it goes from the ring to the trophozoite, the schizome, and, and back into, into new red cells. And so here she's, she's taken parasites that express either wild type K13 or a mutant, and she's pulsed them with DHA for six hours in the traditional ring stage survival assay, or a, a mock of just uh, exposing them to DMSO control. And so the DMSO controls, uh, as expected, have a normal rate of development as measured by transcriptomics. Um, so <clears throat> they're, they're replicating at the same rate we would expect um, with Fremoc treated. If we look at drug sensitives and we pulse them, basically they arrest immediately. So the time of no matter when we sample these parasites, they are all sort of immediately stuck at this six hour post invasion developmental stage. So they, they can no longer uh, develop transcriptionally. Now, if we look at the resistant parasites, what we observe is that after this six hour pulse, when we remove drug and then continue to sample them, they stay in this quiescent state. They aren't developing at all. For about another 18 to 24 hours, they're sort of stuck as early rings, despite the removal of drug. And all of a sudden, asynchronously, they reinitiate growth and they accelerate their way through the trophozoite stage and they basically catch up with the other parasites by the end of the cycle. So they've entered this, this transient reversible quiescent state that is then released as the parasites then reinitiate growth. And what this does is it allows the ring to basically wait out the presence of the artemisinin, because again, these are very short lived drugs. They don't last in the system for very long once you've taken a dose. So if the ring stage can survive, then, then once the drug has, has dropped to subtherapeutic levels, they can reinitiate growth and they can um, basically catch up and, and survive the treatment. Sarshal uh, tried to explore or, or explore the, the molecular basis of this sort of quiescent mechanism. Uh, she used transcriptomics, metabolomics, and proteomics to really interrogate what's the, what's the basal impact or the constitutive impact of introducing a mutation in K13 into the parasite sort of physiology? <clears throat> and the answer is it's very broad. When we combine transcriptomics with metabolomics with proteomics, we see multiple processes that show a difference between K13 mutant and isogenic paired K13 wild type parasites. There are changes in pathways involved in ubiquitination, which is important for protein degradation and turnover which is an important feature of how artemisinins kill because they damage parasite, they damage proteins that then get polyubiquitinated and degraded. Uh, we see signals in lipid transport, in, in signaling, mitochondrial function and carbon and pure metabolism. So, so this is clearly a very central mediator or contributor of, of multiple sort of physiologic processes in the parasite. Uh, we also observed something we, we didn't expect at all which is that when we pulse these parasites with artemisinin and we compare again the K13 mutant to the K13 wild type, and we use microscopy to image the location of, PFC, of K13 uh, using monoclonal antibodies, what we see is a redistribution of K13 towards the mitochondria in the presence of, of the K13 mutation. Uh, we also see it when we pulse the DHA for the wild type. So, in the, so when we pulse parasites with DHA, there's a relocation of some of the K13 towards the mitochondria, <laughs> which was an unexpected result. We follow that up by looking at the, um, at the effect of artemisinin compared to other reference drugs on um, the production of reactive, reactive oxygen species 
in the mitochondria using a, a, a GFP tagged redox sensitive probe that was localized in the mitochondria. And what we see here is that actually DHA, even after only a, four, a short four hour pulse, leads to rapid oxidation of the mitochondria. And so what we suspect, and this is a very difficult project to pursue, is that uh, part of the mode of action of DHA is to perturb mitochondrial physiology. And part of the protective mechanism of K13 may be that the mitochondria is acting as a sensor that's sensing damage from, from uh, the artemisinin drug. And this is actually acting uh, both as a sensor and as a regulator of entry into quiescence and later, once drug is removed, exit from quiescence and reinitiation of cell growth. We've leveraged that uh, because we're always thinking about how one would sort of overcome resistance by examining, uh, in this case, the proteasome, because we know that the proteasome is very important in eliminating the damaged proteins, and we know that artemisinin's damaged proteins uh, leading to their polyubiquitination and elimination through the, through the 20s proteasome. And so what we've done here in this case is we've, um, there's actually two experiments here uh, I should talk about. So the first one is the proteasome, where we show that if you block the proteasome, you prevent it from eliminating uh, damaged proteins, you regain potency of DHA. So you get this strong synergy between uh, uh, an inhibitor of the proteasome and inhibitor of uh, and, and DHA. And you see that whether it's K13 wild type or K13 mutant, and we're, in the next slide I'll be talking about how we're pursuing that to really see if the proteasome, which synergizes with artemisinin, might itself be a very attractive drug target. We also looked at atovaquone because atovaquone is specific to the mitochondria, it blocks the electron transport chain uh, leading to parasite death. And if here we look at a K13 wild type parasite and we compare it with a K13 mutant parasite on the same genetic background, and now we combine these drugs, atovaquone, the mitochondrial drug, with DHA that seems to produce oxidation of the mitochondria. Um, there's no real change in the, in the drug relationship here in the wild type, but in the mutant, you actually see that as you increase the amount of atovaquone, uh, you start to get a significant increase. You start to see significant synergy between these drugs, and you're basically restoring DHA activity. So this is also interesting to us that maybe targeting the mitochondria or the proteasome might represent ways to basically neutralize the resistance mechanism and reinstate um, the potency of the artemisinin itself. So for the proteasome, we, we've now formed a consortium with three sort of leading chemistry labs in the US uh, at Stanford, at Weill Cornell, and at UC San Diego. The Department of Defense is in the, has, has approved us for funding, and they will be funding this consortium that, that I'm leading uh, to figure out which of the different, uh, what we call warheads or chemotypes targeting the proteasome is the most uh, attract, appealing in terms of uh, a minimal resistance risk and in terms of maintaining synergy with artemisinin, and of course being attractive in terms of um, the tractability of developing these as compounds that can proceed into, into sort of development, preclinical development. And so the hope is that within the next two or three years, we'll see, we'll be able to figure out which of these is the best um, chemotype to, to pursue uh, with the goal of developing a, a falciparum proteasome specific inhibitor that can be incorporated into an artemisinin con uh, containing combination that will restore artemisinin activity. So now I focus a lot on the artemisinins, and I'm talking quite slowly, I think, uh, or at least I'm going somewhat slowly, but I want to focus now on the partner drugs, because this really, if you lose, if you lose artemisinin, you get delayed parasite clearance. If you lose the partner drug, that's much more problematic, because then you get treatment failure itself. So as I pointed out, AL, the partner drug is working, and so COITEM, or AL, continues to work. <clears throat> this was not the case with the first line combination in uh, Cambodia and neighboring countries in the greater Mekong subregion, where following the emergence of uh, or the gain of mutation in K13, we saw uh, treatment failure 
of the DHA preparochrome first line combination because of the gain of resistance to preparochrome. And this was uh, very rapid. Um, in 2019, they reported that uh, over 50% of all the, all the cases treated with, with DP or DHA preparochrome in the region uh, were, were failing. And in parts of Thailand, it was up to nearly 90%. So, of course, as with K13, the question is, what's driving this resistance mechanism? Uh, the Oxford group was doing a lot of work sequencing genomes, as was the Pasteur Institute. We had an early, because we worked very closely with DDMNR and colleagues at the Pasteur Institute in Cambodia and Pasteur Paris, uh, we started looking at mutations in PFCRT because in <clears throat> work uh, we had published a few years before, we had shown that PFCRT, the pleurocon resistance transporter, actually could acquire a mutation in the lab that made it preparochrome resistant. But that was not being seen yet in the field. This was a very small cohort. The Oxford group has published a much larger cohort, but the results are actually um, quite similar, where we start to see these new mutations pop up that are, have not been associated with chloroquine resistance in this chloroquine resistance transporter on the digestive vacuole membrane and a very rapid change, and this has been corroborated by, by groups from Oxford, showing a very rapid spread of mutations in PFCRT associated with increasing treatment failures with DHA preparochrome. Uh, working with structural colleagues from Columbia University in 2019, we reported the structure of PFCRT um, uh, using cryo-electron microscopy down to a 3.2 angstrom uh, resolution. These are two isoforms. This is the isoform that was solved. This is a form of PFCRT that's present in South America. That was the, the most sort of amenable to, to structural elucidation. And you can see here we've colored in orange mutations associated with resistance to chloroquine and in blue to perichrome. And you can see here this is a 10 transmembrane helix protein. They form these anti parallel pairs. You can rotate this structure 90 degrees. So now you're looking through the protein from the DV out to the parasite cytosol. And you can see that these mutations are lining the central cavity, basically inward facing on different helices, be it for K for chloroquine or mutations associated with, with preparochrine. And just to point out, the preparochrine resistant mutations all evolved in the context of pre-existing mutations that have been selected with chloroquine. This is the Southeast Asian isoform uh, called DD2, <clears throat> uh, a slightly more complex uh, constellation of mutations that drive chloroquine resistance. Uh, and then a number of different additional single amino acid substitutions that can be added to DD2 that mediate preparochrine resistance. And you can see here again, lining the central cavity uh, present on different transmembrane helices. And just to point three of them out here that I'll talk about in a second, the F145I, uh, the 218F, um, and the T93 over here, basically. So we worked with physiologists on campus to express pure and purify PFCRT in mammalian HEK293 cells, incorporated these into a proteoliposome system, and could then use tritiated drug, so a tritium labeled drug, and measure uptake as a way to measure transport, basically. So if it's taken up into the proteasome, it's indicative of transport through the protein reconstituted into these proteoliposomes. So if we look, for example, at chloroquine, 7G8 is a South American chloroquine system parasite, as is DD2. If you compare it to the wild type allele, which is over here, you can see much more accumulation of. Uh, much more uptake of drug. So this is indicative of efflux. So uptake in this case means that it's transporting it out of the DV. That would be the parasite uh, equivalent. Um, and then if you introduce this mutation that mediates preparochrome resistance, you can see it's not as good at efflux in chloroquine because it's basically compromised the chloroquine resistance mechanism. So there's a dichotomy when you're gaining preparochrome resistance uh, you're actually losing some of the chloroquine efflux properties and you're restoring chloroquine sensitivity to these parasites. 
Now we can look at preparocrin, and what we're seeing with preparocrin, here's this mutation 145i that's been very successful in Southeast Asia. This is another one that's popped up in South America. And you can again see evidence of an efflux mechanism through these mutations um, compared to the wild type. So efflux looking to be a primary mechanism by which um, parasites are acquiring resistance to these drugs through these mutations, changing the cavity of this central transport of PFCRT. We've also had a look at the evolution of resistance in Southeast Asia, and we've taken in this case three mutations that, uh, that have uh, come to fairly high prevalence. 145i, which was the first mutation that arose. Um, and then more recently, we've also seen T93S and 218F start to take over the, the local parasite population in Cambodia. And here you can do the same sort of experiment we do with artemisinin, and this time with preparocrin. We published this uh, by Satish Dingra um, and colleagues in Lancet ID in 2019. So again, it's a log 10 scale. These are uh, drug sensitive parasites. And so you can see as you increase the amount of preparocrine, you get a, a rapid loss of survival. Um, so at low nanomolar concentrations, uh, all parasites are dying. If you look at the 145, which is the first mutant that arose in, South, in, uh, in Cambodia, the remarkable feature here is that no matter how much drug you use, uh, all of these parasites are surviving. If you now look at these, these other variants that have popped up recently, they're nowhere near as resistant as the 145, and yet they're decently resistant. They're about 10%, much, more, uh, much less susceptible, of course, than your controls. And this is just with one additional mutation introduced into DD2. We can also ask about fitness. And what we see here, these, are, um, these again are mixed culture competitions where you mix a parasite with an isogenic control. Uh, in this case, we're introducing a parasite that's GFP positive. If our test parasite is unfit, the GFP parasite will take over the population on the same genetic background. If it's fitter, then the GFP parasite will start to disappear. This is the comparator parasite, DD2. It doesn't have the GFP, so the GFP slows down the reporter line. And so the DD2 is, is demonstrated demonstrably more fit here. And this is the situation with 145. So this is a very resistant organism, but a very unfit organism. <clears throat> and when we compare it to the other variants, 93 and 218, these are far less unfit. And so it's this combination of a much less much smaller impact on fitness combined with a sufficient amount of resistance that we think explains why these ultimately were the most successful. So it doesn't have to be the most resistant. It has to be resistant and not incur a dramatic cost on parasite growth rates in vitro, at least in this case in vitro. We've also asked what would be the impact if we put these into African parasites because DHA preparocrine has been used in multiple trials uh, to try to increase the, the number of different chemopreventive measures in African contexts. And there are lots of different strategies being used. There's seasonal malaria chemoprevention. There's intermittent preventive treatment. Uh, there's also mass drug administration. And so DP is look, being looked at very closely because it has a long half-life of about 35 days. And it would be a very useful drug to introduce uh, in areas to try to reduce the burden of disease uh, across the population and keep AL for treatment of, of active symptomatic infection. And so here we took a parasite from uh, Gabon called GB4, and we've introduced these different amino acid substitutions into the allele, and we looked at the rate of growth as a function of concentration of drug. And so you can see here, here's your sensitives at low concentrations of drug, you get complete uh, inhibition of parasite growth. And the only one that really popped up was this one mutation here, 145, that gave some degree of resistance. You can see here this unusual biphasic curve where these elevated concentrations, parasites are, are able to survive. This is the Southeast Asian form. This is the African form. So not as resistant, but still you're getting some gain of survival. And you can see it... Um, uh, but it's only at the, at the elevated concentrations, it doesn't actually impact the IC50, which is an unusual feature. 
So we're looking at this much more closely now because we'd like to really try to predict if, if preparocin is used more actively in Africa, will resistance arise? Is one mutation enough? Are the, genetic, are the strains in Africa suitable for preparocin to emerge just through single point mutations in PFCRT, which would be problematic? So this is a, so now I'm just gonna go a little bit faster and talk about um, some of the other approaches we're doing in the lab, just to sort of highlight uh, different approaches to the problems. One is the use of these humanized mice to do genetic crosses. This is a very powerful approach. Uh, we do this with Fatini Sinis and colleagues at Johns Hopkins, whereby we import drug resistant parasites, in this case from Cambodia, and we cross them with this African parasite N54. So we clone these, we grow them in the lab as asexual blood stages, we stress them uh, and mix them as gametocytes. And it's in the mosquito that these parasites will recombine and undergo meiosis to form haploid progeny that we can then passage into these humanized mice that have humanized livers and that uh, into which we can also transfuse human red cells to capture the parasites as they come out of the liver. Uh, this slide now, we've been able to extend this to about 110 progeny. Uh, this was an earlier representation of, uh, of genetic maps. These are the 14 chromosomes of falciparum, and you can see all these recombinant progeny with different breakpoints, um, illustrating um, uh, lots of different uh, independent recombinants. And so we can use this to map genetic traits. <clears throat> and we've been interested in quinine, which is a very effective drug for um, intravenous um, treatment of cerebral malaria, which is the most lethal type of malaria. And it's never been understood uh, what is driving quinine resistance. And so we went ahead and looked at quinine. We did the IC50 and the IC90. Um, and here I'm just going to go rather quickly just to show that we can phenotype these. We have whole genome sequence data from all of these progeny. We can use a technique known as quantitative trait loci mapping to map segments of the genomes that are segregating with uh, a particular trait. In this case, in blue, it's quinine. We've also looked at chloroquine and, and the metabolite of chloroquine called monodesethylchloroquine. Chromosome 7 is the PFCRT peak. You can see here, it very cleanly identifies PFCRT as um, the segment that uh, associates with the inheritance of resistance or of a differential susceptibility. And there's another locus here on chromosome 12. We didn't expect that. We think it's compensatory. Maybe it's involved in improving the fitness or reducing the, the uh, negative impact of the changes in the function of this transporter. And we also see quinine. And quinine, actually, it's a different peak. We're narrowing in our search here. It's actually downstream of PFCRT. It's the same locus on chromosome 12. We're having a much closer look on chromosome 7 because we think we're close to understanding what's driving quinine resistance. And that really is a, a question that's been lingering since for 100 years now. And there's a transporter called DMT. It looks quite similar to PFCRT. And there are mutations in the field. And there's also a mutation in the parent. And we're in the process of editing this now to see if indeed this is what's driving that differential quinine um, susceptibility in the progeny. And hopefully this will become a molecular marker of quinine. <clears throat> so that's our investigations on resistance. I want to finish by just showing two slides of other activities in the lab. We're um, the sort of reference center for the medicines from malaria venture, all compounds that are uh, brought into the MMV portfolio are sent to us, and we ascertain the resistance risk. So what we're trying to do is basically de-risk the portfolio from MV if there's a compound that gives resistance very quickly, that is not something we would wish to pursue for further sort of development into the clinic. And so those will get dropped. So there are sort of fairly strict criteria for ascertaining the resistance risk. If we make resistant mutants, we do whole genome sequencing to really start to piece together what is the mode of action of these different compounds, these different chemotypes, and what's the mechanism resistance. And we use that to try to develop an understanding of what we call the druggable genome and the resistor, how do parasites acquire resistance to different chemotypes, and what are the points of intervention 
that are the most appealing for the development of new medicines as we anticipate needing to move away from artemisinins at some point in time. We also work very closely with Elizabeth Winsler, who also gave a lecture to you, um, and a number of colleagues at Harvard and, and WashU and so forth, um, really here to, again, try to define the druggable genome. What are the interesting pathways that we can um, attack pharmacologically uh, to develop new medicines that are not susceptible to existing resistance? And so there's been a lot of work here. The, the Billman and the Gates Foundation is a very major supporter of this work, and we work also with, with MMV. So that's an aspect I haven't focused on too much today, but that's an important component of our lab, which is not only to understand resistance, but help sort of leverage that knowledge to helping identify new chemotypes with new modes of action that could hopefully, of which some hopefully will make it to the clinic and be registered for clinical use to continue to, to keep up with resistance and to overcome drug resistant malaria. So with that, I'll, I'll finish with the conclusions. I've talked about mutant K13 as the molecular marker of artemisinin resistance, <clears throat> that it seems to be helping regulate uh, this acquiescence mechanism <clears throat> involving the regulation drug activation. There's a role for the mitochondria, we believe. We identified novel mutations in PFCRT as mediators of preparacone resistance, some evidence that they could be problematic for resistance in African context. We're looking at that very closely. We've uh, solved the structure of this protein using cryo-EM, and now we're actually running high-throughput screens to see if PFCRT itself may be a good target, drug target. If we can block efflux of drug through PFCRT, we could again restore activity of these, of these compounds that have already been developed for clinical use. <clears throat> we're using genetic crosses. We're always on the lookout for new resistant uh, parasites because we want to leverage that to quickly identify molecular markers, and this is in an unbiased way, and using resistant studies to inform new drug discovery and development efforts uh, to try to develop new medicines. And that's the team. Uh, I went a little bit over time. I apologize for that. Um, but I didn't want to go too quickly. Um, and I especially want to thank you for your attention and uh, turn it over to you, Sachin. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much for your wonderful and detailed talk. I'm very delighted to see the activities going on, you know, in multiple aspects in your lab. So uh, first, uh, uh, Dr. Amish Sharma will ask a question. He has some questions. Uh, David, that was really fantastic. Uh, two day force work on so many, so many interesting and and really exciting projects in terms of uh, drug resistance, especially. Uh, I just have a quick question in terms of the specifically the C five eighty Y. Right. Uh, uh, you mentioned the the possible role of other elements within the parasite genome on drug resistance of any given marker. So right. In short, the question is, have you compared several C580 mutants where the genetic backgrounds are different in terms of mm. uh, growth survival, uh, RSA, as well as um, uh, competition in terms of uh, fitness costs? Yes, we have. So, and, it's, and there's very significant differences, um, both in terms of fitness costs and in terms of the degree of resistance. So it is very strain dependent. So, for example, in the African parasites, we've now introduced mutations in K13. And as a rule of thumb, the same mutation will, will yield much less resistance in the African strains tested so far compared to some of the <clears throat> recent um, contemporary uh, drug resistance strains from Cambodia. The fitness cost in Southeast Asian parasites is also significantly less. So there's some component of their genomes that has really sort of mitigated the resistance impact of these muta of the mutations in K13. Uh, Oxford tried to identify these secondary determinants of resistance. <clears throat> we have looked at those, and none of those really map out. So we've also got a genetic cross, and we are seeing two other segments uh, physically unrelated to K13 that are co-segregating with K13 that that associate with high level resistance. And we're gonna to try to figure out, <clears throat> sorry, what those genes are. 
but we don't yet know. So the other thing we will do is we'll look at fitness as an inheritable trait and see if we can identify those loci. It's definitely, it's complex. It's, they're, hard, they're hard secondary determinants to find. And, and they may be mostly to do with fitness, more than resistance in a way. Yeah. Oh, um, you are muted, sir. Muted. Yeah. Yeah. In context of low transmission areas where it's likely that the there is only a mono infection and not multiple parasites, multiple, uh, you know, strains uh, infecting the same individual, there the fitness cost may not be borne out necessarily because there isn't any competition. Is that so? Well, that's what we assumed, but actually, um, I think even in that, we always assume that the, that the most important component of fitness would be in the high transmission. And I think that's still true, but, but my sense is that fitness continues to be an issue even in areas of low transmission. Probably not so much because of competition with other parasites, but maybe because it affords the, the host more opportunity to, to eliminate that infection naturally through their immune system um, because they're slower growing. So, for example, it's unusual. Even K13 these days, now that they've moved away from DP, DHA, preparacrine to coartem, K13 mutations are dropping actually, in, most recently in, in Cambodia. And it makes me want, either that's because lumefantrine is eliminating the K13 mutant parasites more effectively, which is possible, or because they are slightly unfit and there's a, and there's a tendency away from them, even in a low transmission setting. But, but for sure, the fitness impact will be the most important in high transmission where it's all about competitive growth rates between mixed infections in a single host. That's true. Yeah. Th thank you. I'm done. Thank you very much, uh, David. Okay. Uh, uh, so we have a question from Dr. Manjurai. She is uh, she is the nodal officer from ICMR for Mayor India program. Dr. Rahi. There. Okay. Meantime, uh, if if you permit me, may I ask some questions? Seems she's. We may have lost her. She may have logged out. I, I went yeah. late. Okay. So we have uh, other questions. If you permit me. So uh, there's a question: Is uh, <clears throat> what's your view on emergence of? Artemisinin in the instance in Africa, is it independent origin with drug pressure or something else playing a role in the emergence of resistance? So it's interesting because we've seen it now in three countries. So it's clearly in Uganda and Rwanda and Eritrea. The Eritrea data are unpublished yet, but it's going to happen fairly soon. And in some areas, the prevalence is starting to be quite high. It's, it's up to 25%, for example, in some parts of Uganda. The assumption would be that it was only going to happen in areas with low rates of malaria, because, you know, it, you, you had maybe the control measures were effective and the immunity was dropping and there wasn't much competition between parasites. And so it could be a little bit like a Southeast Asian context. But, but but unusually that hasn't that doesn't seem to be yet the case. The areas where resistance has emerged in K thirteen um, are in fairly high transmission areas actually. And and why did it pop up now? Why did it take, um, I guess, nearly twenty years? Because these are not Southeast Asian strains coming over. These are de novo emergent events in in African parasites. Again, one has to imagine that there's some sort of conditioning of the genome that's also required. Because we know from our resistance selection studies in the lab, if a mutation is easy to get, you can get it with 10 to the 8 organisms. You know, and yet we're dealing with untold numbers of parasites in, in Africa. So it may be that those mutations were appearing, but they weren't successful until other aspects of the genome sort of allowed those mutations to take hold because they sort of corrected any detrimental impact on parasite physiology. That's what we don't know. But what we do know so far is that we do see resistance when we introduce K13 mutations into African strains, but not all strains. And it's not as resistant as Southeast Asia, and they're not as fit. 
<clears throat> that's all we know for now. Okay, so this is this is another uh, from our colleague, Dr. Parin Bharti. This question was from him. We can see him now. Is another uh, uh, linked question is, is there any evidence that partner drug are somehow responsible for Artemis in resistance? If so, then what mechanism takes place? Can you just repeat that one question? I didn't get the first part. Yeah, so is, is there any evidence that partner drug are somehow responsible for Artemis in resistance? If so, then what mechanism takes place? Right. Um, so if we look historically in Southeast Asia, the thought is that it's the that the that K thirteen evolved resistance to artemisinin, and, and then piperacone evolved independently, and then they recombined, and that was a successful combination. That these were sort of sympatric populations. So I I don't think I don't think the partner drug was driving resistance to to artemisinin, but I think the gain of resistance to artemisinin certainly increased the pressure for uh, resistance to, to, to spread to the partner drug. Um, that's, that's, I mean, if we look, for example, at artesanate SP, that's an interesting situation, right? Because SP, there's a lot of resistance to SP, but it hasn't compromised the artesanate um, that I know of. So I don't think we've seen that situation yet, actually. Coartem is an interesting one, AL, um, because again, when they put AO into Cambodia, mutant K13 started to actually disappear. So is lumefandrine better against artemisinin resistant parasites than it is against sensitive? That's possible. Certainly there are situations like that. You know, lumefandrine selects against mutant PHRT, so that selected against chloroquine resistance. So you do have these opposing pressures sometimes. Um, that's what I can say for now. Okay, thank you. So we have uh, uh, Professor Ashish Das. He is a senior professor of, at uh, Villa Institute of uh, Science and Ecology. Uh, he is from uh, Biological Sciences. Can we give the access to Professor Ashish Das? And he's closely worked with Mera India. Professor Asis Das? Yeah. Uh, good morning, Dr. Frida. Uh, good morning. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Yeah. Uh, I have a question which was partly answered by you in the previous question. Uh, when we talk about partner drugs and main drugs and the mutational accumulation in them, which do you think drives the fitness of the mutant parasite, the partner drug mutations or the main drug mutations? Mutations against the main drug or against the partner drugs? Right. So that's, um, that become, that's very dependent on the mechanism. So right. with K13 and artemisinin, the fitness impact in Southeast Asian parasites is minimal. And what really drew, and with piperoquine, the fitness impact is substantial. So as long as piperoquine was being in that context, it's the partner drug that drives the fitness outcome. And that's why when they replaced DP with AL in, in Cambodia, the PFCRT mutation started to disappear because it's so unfit that it reverted to a different status. And we can, we've even seen it. We see second side mutations where basically the fitness was resolved because the partner drug fitness, resistance mechanism was too unfit. Um, we see that also with mefloquin. Mefloquin has a fitness cost. When they started to, when they removed mefloquin, this was way back, this was many years ago in, in Asia before they put in piperoquin. Again, when you removed artesanate mefloquin, the fitness cost of mefloquin was so great, it was sufficient that when you remove the pressure, then the wild type parasites came back. Um, so I, I think it's a function of the of the cost of the resistance mechanism. But so far, at least in Asia, it's the partner drug fitness that drives the that drives the the selection and the counter selection when you remove the drug. So I think also you know that also evokes the argument 
of trying to figure out which are the combinations that neutralize each other. We, we're very interested in the lab about these evolutionary traps. So, for example, piperacone and chloroquine select against each other. Uh, amidiacrine and, and mefloquine also select against each other. So there's some rationale for either letting the marketplace have these drugs there to compete against each other, one selects in one way and one selects in the other, or probably more difficult would be to make triple combination therapies with these types of counter-selective pressures for the partner drug. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, one more question in the chat box. Do you think the biological processes linked to K13 mutation is also associated with other mutations that have been identified to confer resistance? To adenosinins? To, uh, I mean, this is not mentioned, but I assume yes. Um, right, so if we, so, <clears throat> So we know of other mutations that can phenocopy artemisinin resistance. Birnbaum, Sp Toby Spillman had a beautiful science paper on um, K13 interacting um, proteins. It was called KIC, the K13 interacting complex. And there's one, for example, called KIC7, which um, you can mutate KIC7 and get artemisinin resistance in vitro. Um, you don't see it in the field because presumably that's not successful enough in the field to, to have taken hold and spread. Um, there's another one called coronin, which again in the lab has been shown to mediate artemisinin resistance, but again, hasn't really been successful in the field. So I think anything in that pathway um, can achieve resistance probably. Um, it's just a question of which is the most fit in the in the in the real world you know that that will be the most successful and also to some extent probably chance but there's nothing other than k13 that we know of that's a successful mediator of artemisinin resistance in the field but there have been some additional um uh, mutations that can that can sort of phenocopy or mimic artemisinin resistance in the lab with regards to the partner drug um there are intersections in the biology that all stem from hemoglobin because they're all intersecting with that pathway. And I think that explains a lot of the, of the selective pressures that we see. Um, and, and, it's, and a lot of it comes back to PFCRT and MDR1 and how they translocate drug. Um, that's part of it, but also, um, yeah. So, so, so hemoglobin metabolism and heme detoxification are, are really central to artemisinins and and all the partner drugs with the exception of SP. So when you change, when you get resistance to one, often you start to see other changes, changes in susceptibility to other drugs. And that's why we're very interested in figuring out those relationships because that would inform us which are the right combinations to use. So for example, we know that, that chloroquine is actually very effective against preparacone resistant parasites. So that becomes a very attractive possibility that just add chloroquine and you'll prevent preparacone resistance from emerging um, uh, if you start with a sensitive parasite or, or from recrudescing if it's resistant to begin with. I think that was the answer to the question. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, if you permit, uh, this, our team member, Dr. Sonal, wants to ask a question. Yes, Sonal. Uh, thank you for very uh, interesting talk, uh, sir. So uh, just to tell you that I was really uh, following your research papers because uh, in my postdoctoral I was working on anti-malarial drug resistance. So I have a yeah, question here. Like very interestingly, you showed that by transcriptomics and metabolomics and proteomics study that K13 mutations, they are linked to biological processes like ubiquitination. Right. Right. So uh, uh, there was a paper, uh, I think that came uh, very recently in 2018 or 19, that uh, says that mutation in genes which are associated with autophagy-like pathway, mm -hmm. for example, ATG18. So it right. confer, yeah, it confers uh, additional resistance to, uh, I mean, in uh, K13 mutant parasite strains. So what are your comments on that? Yeah, so I, I think again, you know, these these weren't necessarily so ATG eighteen is is very interesting. 
because there is some association clinically, bet or in the field, I should say, between mutations in ATG18 and K13. So it makes sense to me, actually, that in a way, <clears throat> this whole process of, of I, I think the way ATG18 is working probably is that, again, it's, it's reducing the level of proteotoxic stress in the parasite that is sort of one of the direct, direct causes of death resulting from, from artemisinin action. Um, so, and I think they have complementary roles. And, and that's what's so tricky about K13. So, so the major hypothesis for K13 is that it's restricting the rate of import of hemoglobin. And so you're getting less activation in the ring. <clears throat> what, that's the data from Birnbaum and Spielman. What we found is that it's, it's more complicated than that. It's not just reducing hemoglobin in cytosis. It's also impacting polyubiquitination. It's also impacting mitochondrial oxidation, you know, mitochondrial um, redox sensing. And so, you know, it relates to how the drug works. So you're getting partial resistance by reducing the rate of activation of the drug with hemoglobin. But you're also, if you also prevent the proteotoxic stress, you, you know, you minimize the, the reactive stress on the power site, you improve its ability to eliminate polyubiquitinated proteins. All of these mechanisms can add to the overall level of resistance. What, we, what the power site has not figured out yet is how to make itself resistant at the trophozoite stage. And that's why artemisinins is still fairly effective. And I think it's because the parasite doesn't know how to do it. It can't evolve resistance to the trophozoite. Once it does, then artemisin will be really a useless drug. But we've never seen that. These are really ring stage specific resistance mechanisms. But I think probably ATG18, um, you know, can help reduce the stress on the more mature stages, like the where it's because artemisin is so is so polyvalent in its activity, right? It's it's alkylating lipids, it's damaging proteins, it's damaging membranes, it's it's very pleiotropic. So the parasite, you know, is trying all these different pathways, including through autophagy to, to mitigate that um, that activity. Oh, you're muted. Yeah, thank you, sir. So I have uh, one more thing to ask here. Like in your initial slides where you were describing about the uh, uh, mechanism, how the anti-malarial targets in the blood stages. So you mentioned that chloroquine, it binds to the heme, if I'm correct, I mean like, mm -hmm. and prevent the detoxification. It's conversion into right. the hemozoin, right? So, I mean, like there are many reports which also, I mean, says that uh, it changes the pH of digestive vacuole. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, like, uh, and in other system also, chloroquine is being, uh, like, uh, mentioned as a uh, inhibitor of autophagy. So, are there, right. I mean, so are there many mechanisms by which this chloroquine also works in uh, parasite, against parasite? Yeah, I mean, I, I imagine that the pH is is really a function of the very high concentration accumulation of drug in the digestive vacuole and the sensitive parasites. Um, at higher concentrations, we do see that chloroquine inhibits the degradation of hemoglobin itself. Um, so it doesn't take much more drug to see that start to affect. That might be a pH dependent activity that basically it's, it's changing the pH that results in reduced activity of the hemoglobinases, and so you, less degradation of hemoglobin, which has the same net effect ultimately. But um, so, so that's a possibility. Um, other ways, we've looked for, you know, Paul Ropey had a study where he thought that depending on the concentration of drug, you may also have cytostatic versus cytosidal activity of chloroquine, that, that some are lethal and some are is simply inhibiting slowing parasite growth, and there might be an autophagic response to that or component of that. We tried to map that in the genetic cross, and, and we can't pull out cytostatic mechanisms that might involve autophagy for chloroquine yet, but we, we definitely tried, yeah. ATG18, I haven't seen it linked to chloroquine. It's an interesting, it's an interesting point though. We should have a look at that. Thank you.
Okay, so with this, I understand it's quite late for you. Uh, yeah, you're letting me go to bed. This is great. It's eleven fifty-two. I need to go to sleep. I, I wake up at six. You, you've given me six hours. <laughs> I know, I know. This can this can go on, but uh, with this, uh, uh, thank you very much. We are now concluding this uh, wonderful talk of the of this uh, series, and uh, I really thank you from the uh, on behalf of uh, ICMR, NAMR, and Mira India team. Thank you very much for giving us time. And I, I uh, uh, invite you whenever you are in India, please visit us and we would love to hear you again in person here. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Thanks. Okay. Bye-bye. Nice to see you all. Bye-bye.